Hello and welcome to episode 4 of the Getting Started with the Kindle UI and JSP Wrapper Screencast series. In this episode, I'll dive deeper into the Kindle UI grid by exploring its editing capabilities. I'll enable simple editing in the grid, and then I'll enable deleting and creating. Lastly, I'll add some validation to that editing. I'm picking up almost right where I left off in episode 3, with the exception of the fact that I have created a supplier's endpoint and a categories endpoint with corresponding do list methods and their repositories. These methods return all of the items in those tables, and I'll be needing this data later on. I think by now that you've watched me create enough repositories and servlets. To make the grid editable, I can just tell the grid that it is in fact editable by setting its editable attribute. This allows me to click into a cell and have it go into edit mode. I'm going to be using inline editing though. This is when an edit button is in place in every column and clicking that button will make the entire row go into edit mode. To do that, I'll set the editable mode on the grid to inline. To create the column of buttons, I'm gonna use a command column and specify that I want it to be an edit command. Kindle UI will use this to create a button with an icon that puts the entire row into edit mode when it's clicked. It also switches the edit button into an update or cancel button when it's in edit mode. The update will fire the update action on the data source. I haven't defined that yet, so let me do it now. The data source transport allows for update, create, and delete configurations just like it does the simple read. All of these operations are going to call the same servlet, but they're going to call the do post method instead of the do get. I'll specify the action that I want to perform in the servlet in terms of an update, delete, or create by adding it to the query string. In the servlet, I first need to map the request that's coming into the do post method to a product model object. Now, normally, you would also do some server side validation here. It's always good to validate on the client and the server. I also need to add an update method to the product's repository. I'll add in a prepared statement as usual, and then apply the parameters and execute the query. Now notice that this method is void and doesn't return any value. The grid will assume that the update happened in the database successfully as long as I do not return an error from that do post method. Now while I'm here, I'm going to create the do delete and do create methods as well. The do delete method is very straightforward since I just have to delete the item with the ID that was passed. The create method is a bit different in that the grid will be expecting me to return the product that was just created. And I need to know what the ID is that the database assigned to the new product. I can specify this in the prepared statement and then return it from the method. In the do post, after mapping the request, I'll take the appropriate action based on what was specified in the query string. Only the create method actually needs to return a response. In order for the update to actually fire, I need to tell Kindle UI a little bit about the structure of the data. Specifically, the data source needs to know which field is the unique ID for a record. And I can do this by setting the ID property of the data source schema model element to product ID. The update button now fires the update transport and an item is updated in the database. However, there are a few problems here. Most notably, the suppliers and categories are plain text fields. And as I know from the database, these are not actually text fields, but they're relationships. I need the user to be able to select from a list of suppliers or categories. And this is where custom grid editors come in. Custom editors specify a JavaScript function which will return a Kindle UI control instead of just displaying a plain text field. I'll set the editor attribute on the supplier and category columns to be functions that are not yet created. I'll also specify the field to be the actual object itself, and I'll use the template attribute to tell the grid which field in the object I want it to display visually. The editor function will take in two parameters. The first is the container or the row, and the second is a reference to the item that's currently being edited. I can create a Kindle UI dropdown list by first creating an input element and specifying some of its data attributes. And this is something that's called declarative initialization in Kindle UI. And it's where the HTML defines 
all or some of the configuration of the control using the HTML5 data attributes. I'll also bind its value to the options field, which will give us the current ID of the supplier associated with this product, which then selects the correct item in the dropdown list. I'll then append this input to the container and initialize it as a Kindle UI dropdown list, specifying its read transport as the supplier's endpoint. The category editor is nearly identical, except that it's dealing with categories and not suppliers. The edit form looks quite a bit better now, as the user actually gets a list of suppliers and categories to choose from, and the correct one is already selected for them. And now I just need to implement create and delete. The delete portion is just another button in the command column. This button just fires the destroy transport. However, it doesn't ask me if I'm sure, and I don't want the user to accidentally delete an entire row. I can specify the confirmation attribute on the editable element, which will give me an alert box for confirmation. For the create, I'll use a Kindle UI grid toolbar. Now, just like with command columns, I just need to specify that I want an item called create, and Kindle UI takes care of all of the UI plumbing that it takes to provide the update and cancel buttons as well. However, Kindle UI doesn't know what to do about the supplier and category fields right now when a new item is created. It knows that it's an object, but it doesn't know of what type. And I need to inform the data source about the structure of the model of the data by specifying the category and supplier fields on the model object in the schema element. I need to define what the default values for a supplier and a category field are. This I can set to a new supplier and category item. Now the user gets a full row with a dropdown list for supplier and category. At this point, edit, create, and delete in the grid are all working. I want to add a little validation to this editor. Currently, I need for the product name field to be required so users can't blank it out. I can specify this by giving the grid more information about the model. I'll specify a model field for product name and then specify that its validation rules are that it is required. I'll also specify the unit price and units in stock fields. But for them, I'll specify that they're number types. Not only do I need those fields to be required, but I also want to make sure that they have a minimum value of at least one. Much more advanced validation can be done with fields using regex and the pattern attribute. I'll also designate the discontinued field as a Boolean so the grid will display a checkbox instead of plain text. The grid now provides a numeric stepper for the price and units and stock fields and won't let me blank out them or the product name. The last thing that I want to change is the mode. Now, right now, when I click the edit button, the grid goes into edit mode, but it looks a bit jumbled and the buttons are stacked on top of each other. Now, I could spend a lot of time fiddling around with column widths, but the grid actually provides a much nicer option here. It has a pop-up mode, and this gives a really nice pop-up window that has plenty of real estate in it for editing a really nice clean interface. Let's review what we've learned so far in this screencast series. In episode one, we talked about how to get started, how to install the wrappers, and how to create a simple Kindle UI control. In episode two, we looked at binding those controls to data on the server and what it takes to display a complex relationship such as a hierarchical one. In episode three, we looked at the very robust Kindle UI grid and what it takes to configure a grid as well as communicate with the server to do things like paging. And in this final episode, we looked at how to create a complete editing interface based on top of a complex relationship in an underlying relational database. Thank you so much for watching this screencast series on getting started with Kindle UI and the JSP wrappers. For more information, make sure to visit the online demos as well as the documentation and of course the Kindle UI Dojo at try.kindoui.com which provides an interactive environment for learning the Kindle UI mobile, web, and data visualization framework. Thanks!